Many people are aware that some animals are trapped and killed for their fur, but they're not aware that the vast majority of fur comes from what can only be described as fur factory farms in which animals are kept in very confined conditions. Over 100 million animals are killed in this way every year. Now the question is, can it be justifiable ethically to kill and inflict distress on animals simply for an inessential product like fur? This has been the major topic under discussion uh, at the fourth annual summer school organised by the Oxford Centre for Animal Ethics, this year in partnership with Respect for Animals Educational Trust. Every three seconds an animal is killed for its fur around the world and as such it represents a major issue for animal ethics today. And so we have brought together here at St Stephen's House Oxford leading academics from around the world. Historians, lawyers, sociologists, academics are all here to talk about the ethics of fur. My talk has been on um, the influence of pop music culture on the contemporary debate on the use of animal fur. What I've found is that um, pop music, whether intentionally or not intentionally, is promoting um, the use of fair as a stasis symbol. One of the biggest ethical concerns with fair is that it's extracted in a way that makes other beings suffer and it's totally unnecessary for human beings. So it is unnecessary suffering. What I've been speaking about is the commodification of animals and thinking about the way in which um, designers are marketing fur as a luxury item and as a luxury green item and I'm offering a critique of that notion. So the problem with the fur industry and the way they market green and eco-friendly fur is that it helps consumers legitimize and justify their use of fur when they would not otherwise be inclined to do so based on being kind to the environment and being environmentally friendly. But the sad truth is, use of fur is not environmentally friendly. It's very detrimental to the environment. Law is very pragmatic in the way that it works. It takes a long time to change and only changes in the, in the face of what is pretty much overwhelming evidence. My claim here is that that evidence now exists, has existed for quite a long time, and that the law needs to change. The science and the philosophy speak very loudly that the situation regarding fur animals needs to change and it's just a question of how we change it. We presented the China Fur Report and it's actually research that Actasia has done into China's um, position within the global fur trade and industry. What we found unfortunately is that China is at the moment the largest importer, uh, exporter, processor and consumer country in the fur industry in the world. Fashion has a deep cultural significance and is not merely a piece of frippery that can be changed and that in order to change fashion we need to change the culture and so end cruelty. Of course if we go back a hundred years ago and two hundred years ago um, animal skins were like money. Uh, they had value. Uh, even today, if you go to certain parts of the globe, the tusk of an elephant is worth, worth a fortune. And so as long as uh, animals are bringing us some kind of a commodity, I think we'll always have capitalists that are trying to uh, basically capitalize on that. I remember um, one of the things that I thought was so fabulous was having a fabulous fur. Wouldn't that be great? They look so good on, and that just says something special about you. And um, and then I saw a film on it, and I saw the live skinning of an animal. And so I couldn't wear fur anymore. The most important issue for me with fur ethics um, is that we recognize our attitude towards 
appropriating other animals and it's it's a, it's a feminist it's a queer um, you know racially informed post-colonial issue where we're not supposing superiority over other animals my paper presentation was on furry clerical cloth uh, I was looking at uh, Pope Benedict the 16th who reintroduced fur in papal fashion there was a lot of criticism um, once because it looked kind of pompous and uh, kind of self-aggrandizement. Uh, on the other hand, um, he uh, was criticized by animal protection organization because he didn't consider the suffering of uh, ermines and animals uh, that were killed for fur. I come from a fashion design background and, and cu the couture industry, so uh, I was interested in seeing uh, what designers are doing now? What's the next generation of designers doing? And a lot of them are looking at alternatives to fur and to animal hide and to feathers. It's really an exciting time right now where designers are moving away from the traditional way of dealing with garments. You know, jackets no longer have to have fur. There's no excuse for it. This year, my talk is on ethical decisions in Puritan dress, where I examine as an art historian the portrait of Lieutenant Governor William Stoughton. I examine his ethical decisions to wear fur during my examination of the New England fur trade, and I see the cognitive dissonance between dress and Puritan divine leadership and the ensuing fur trade that was going on at the same time. My talk explored the possibility of humane fur production, and I argued that the interest that the animal has in not being killed outweighs the interest that the fur wearer has in wearing fur and that this can show that fur is morally impermissible even if we assume that animals lack moral rights. We're very proud to be associated with the college and of course with Andrew and Claire who have organised this fantastic event. The depth and the wisdom of the speakers is just incredible and we've learnt as, you know, as so-called experts on the fur issue, we've learnt so much. Mm -hmm.